Harja, I want to thank you all for joining us um, this evening um, for the next section of the reflections um, as part of the 40th anniversary of the hunger strikes. Um, tonight we have with us Kethel Crumley and Jennifer McCann and they are going to be talking about the period up to and including the deaths of Bobby, Frank, Rimmon and Patsy and in Derry, the deaths of Pop and George. Now, I'm not going to say too much because I'm sure everyone here just would rather hear from Cahill and Jennifer themselves um, and let us know just their experiences and stuff from the time. So I'm going to open it up to both of these. Um, and Cahill, if you maybe want to go first, um, can you share your memories of the time, in particular the deaths of Bobby, Frank, Rimmon and Patsy? Okay, Kira. Uh, well, in the lead up to the Fermanagh South Road by election, which occurred on the 9th of April, there was a lot of uh, programs going on, a lot of campaigning going on around the situation in the Hitch Blocks and, and in Armagh. And uh, in the weeks after Bobby started the hunger strike on the 1st of March. There was a series of meetings about how to develop and broaden out the campaign in support of the prisoners. And I attended a meeting in Belfast along with some other uh, comrades. And there was a discussion about how they might well internationalize the campaign on behalf of the, the prisoners in the hate blocks in Armagh and in more particularly in support of the hunger strikers, and uh, which had, at that stage was already underway. And as a consequence of that, I agreed to, to go on a tour, a speaking 10 day speaking tour in Norway. And that was set for the, the, the what we didn't know at the time, but it was set for the day after uh, Bobby's election in the uh, Fermanagh South Tyrone by-election. The night before that, I took a phone call uh, from Tom Hartley, uh, who basically said to me, look, Cal, there's been a slight change of plan here, but come on ahead on down to Dublin, and we'll have a wee chat about what's going on. And so I made my way to Dublin, got round to 44, and I was met by... Uh, Tom Hartley and Ted Hoyle, who was looking after the international desk on behalf of the party at the time. And it was quite a shock to me because it was a complete change of plan. And in a nutshell, I was told I wasn't uh, going to Norway any longer, but the proposal was to send me to the United States on a prolonged, extensive uh, support campaign on behalf of the hunger strikers. And so later that day, I left to the United States with no idea when I'd ever get back or how all of that would work out. Uh, but nevertheless, I agreed to do it. At that point, there was already uh, two former blanket prisoners over there, Noel Cassidy from Monaghan and Shimi Delaney from Ardoin, and they'd already been doing work. So... The brief I had was essentially to go out there now to strengthen that up and to pick up on what was a huge demand for information and publicity uh, around the five demands of the, the hunger strikers. And, uh, and so I ended up in the United States. And for the next uh, period of time, I... Uh, took part in all the campaigns, huge publicity campaigns, television, media, radio, all of that. And it was quite extensive. And we basically worked from morning to night and we were all over the East Coast initially. And, uh, and so those things uh, were fairly extensive. A lot of vigils in support of the hunger strikers and support of uh, Bobby, particularly at that point. And, uh, and so it was very busy. 
it was a real eye-opener to me because I had some reservations as to where I wanted to go to the United States. Truth be told, I wanted to stay in Derry and I wanted to stay in Ireland. And that's the truth of the matter. Uh, but within a few days of being there, it became fairly obvious to me that I was in the right place and that the campaign needed support and we needed the involvement of the United States and particularly our supporters in the United States uh, in order to uh, bring about a process that would potentially save Bobby and the other uh, hunger strikers' lives. Thank you, Cal. So whenever you were in the US then, um, how did the people receive you there and what was their opinions of what was happening back here in the North? Well, there was a huge interest right across the United States in what was happening in Ireland and in the hunger strike in particular. And there's a huge uh, Irish diaspora uh, in North America. And, uh, and so everybody wanted to be involved. Everybody wanted to support the prisoners. Everybody wanted to support the hunger strikers. Uh, our main job was to give people information, was to encourage people to campaign to write letters to British embassies, to regular politicians or senators or Congress, men and women, uh, and to highlight the plight of the hunger strikers and the, the absolutely dreadful situation of the prisoners in the hitch blocks and the women in, in Armagh. And, and so there was a huge wave of support uh, in the United States for the hunger strikers. Uh, at times, people had difficulty giving vent to what, what was a growing anger against the Thatcher's government at the time. And, uh, and so there was a lot of protests, a lot of vigils, a lot of rallies. We spent most of our time going around media outlets because it was an almost constant demand uh, for media appearances. Uh, I hadn't entirely legislated for that, but after a few weeks of doing it, uh, we, we, we developed uh, good skills in terms of uh, putting forward the case of uh, the, the prisoners and the five demands and what all that was about and the British occupation of Ireland and providing a broader political context for everything that was going on. And uh, and so we, we, we sought to kind of fill that demand all the time. Uh, I was there under the stewardship of Irish Northern Aid, who had uh, chapters all over North America. And wherever they could organize an itinerary, we went. I could be in New York one day, fly to Pittsburgh the next one, and fly back to New York the following day. So wherever there was work for us to do, Wherever there was a platform or a media outlet that could help to uh, develop support for the hunger strikers, then we went and that's what we did. And that's the way it was organized. Uh, I was at a, a rally outside the British home stores in uh, Philadelphia. And there was thousands of people there uh, on that occasion. And... On the 5th of May, we were driving back through the city centre in Philadelphia when the news came on that Bobby had, had died, passed away. And uh, the, the man who was driving the van was called uh, John McGarrigle, older uh, man whose family had originally come from Ireland. In the back of the van, there were two black coffins laid out in the back of the van. And they, these were essentially props that people used at various vigils and protests and so on. But the point being, we were absolutely dumbstruck because I had left Ireland with every great expectation that we could save Bobby and the other hunger strikers' lives. Now, we weren't naive about it. Kiva, you know, we understood what we were up against in terms of Thatcher's government and their belligerence towards Ireland and all of that. So we knew all that. 
But to hear the news that Bobby had died coming over the radio, driving through the city centre in Philadelphia, it was just surreal, really trying to contemplate where I was when this was going on, uh, what would be the consequences, how many more people would die. All of those thoughts were going through our heads. And we drove to the, the house, or the home, of uh, an old Republican. He was known in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania generally as Old Man Flynn. We went to his house. Uh, old Man Flynn was a veteran of the War of Independence and had emigrated to the United States in, in the years following it and was a huge figure in Republican circles in uh, Philadelphia. We went to his house, uh, got on the door, I can remember the old man giving me a glass of whiskey. Uh, definitely needed it. There's no question about that. Swallowed it down. And we sat around for half an hour, just mulling over the consequences of Bobby's death, what his family was feeling, consequences in Ireland, how all that was going to work out, what we might do next in terms of the supporters in the United States and so on. And, you know, we just basically went around on that. I think we were absolutely bewildered. But it didn't last very long. Almost immediately, uh, the next morning, there was a huge demand for media for appearances. And as I said earlier, there were three of us who crisscrossed the United States all during that period. And, uh, and so very early the next morning, <clears throat> we did media everywhere we could get it. And uh, but the the death of Bobby was a huge story in the United States. It was wall to wall, morning to night, and it was a huge demand for people like us to give some uh, interpretation or context uh, for what all that was about. And uh, and so that's that's my memory of when Bobby died. In the days that followed, we were so busy, we kept moving around, going to different events, covering different uh, uh, issues all over the East Coast at that particular point. And so whilst we were feeling the weight of the whole situation, we also had to keep working. I mean, we had to keep on going uh, with the programme. Thank you, Cahal. It must have been a really tough time, especially being so far away from home whenever all this had started to, to happen, especially with the death of Bobby. Um, and Jennifer, I know you were a friend um, of Bobby, so you knew him not just as an activist, but he was a friend of yours. Um, do you mind sharing your memories of around the time of his death and Frank Ruman and Patsy as well? Well, I mean, um, I think like, like most people who were, were in Armagh at that time, um, I think the, that it really was, you were going through sort of uh, a whole different set of emotions. Um, I think that, that that just leading up to Bobby's death, we had a, a you know the wee Chris Lives radios that you would have had in the, in the jails at that time because you had no access to our new radios. Um, and I remember, you know, particularly the, the night or uh, the day he was elected as MP for Fermanagh South Tyrone. And, you know, people were very, very hopeful. We were very, very hopeful. You know, you're, you're sort of way your hopes were, were it, was, it was a whole mixture of emotions. Um, and I, I think that, that really the, that in terms of the, um, in terms of, of the actual uh, hearing about his death, um, as I say, uh, I had a, I had one of the crystallized radios in my cell, um, and he had been quite ill. Um, I think from the Sunday, his family and that had been sent for, and um, you know we were all sort of, you know, it was. I think as Cahill said, it was a bit, you know, you were you were just sort of um, anger, a mixture of anger and a mixture of you know um, sadness as well. And um, then on the radio, we heard about the, the rat and stuff and, and things like that. So we knew, you know, we just knew even before it, it came on. So uh, I think that, that like a lot of us, I mean, it wasn't just me who would have known Bobby. There were other women there who knew him as well. 
but I think that, that there was a comradeship there even from the people who, who wouldn't have known him personally. Um, I think that, that the, the weight of it was just, you know, it was just unbelievable. It was, it was just, in one sense, you knew, you knew what the Brits were, were, were capable of. But in another sense, you were you were always still hopeful. You know, these were these were five basic demands. Obviously, there was a bigger a bigger issue about the criminalisation of our struggle and everything else. But you know, there were very basic demands. And when you go into the whole history of of the the jail protests, right through from 1976, it was always you know it, it was it was basic to be treated uh, as political prisoners. But the the demands that we had, the five demands, were very basic. Um, Human humanitarian demands, and I think that that for 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 the for the any anybody to um, allow people to die on hunger strike for that, you know what I mean, in terms of from the Brits' point of view. But obviously, we knew it was a bigger issue. It was um, the the issue was about the criminalisation of our struggle because we weren't we we weren't criminals. We were political prisoners. We had one day got political status, and the next day we hadn't got it. Um, and I think that that you know that, that that was you know leading up to that, but I, I, I for just in terms of the very personal sense, it was a very big personal loss. I mean, um, I, I first met Bobby when I was sixteen, in the the Tuamberg estate. I, I would have known his family, but he would have been in prison at the time that whenever I would have got friendly with um, uh, his sister. And basically, um, you know, uh, it was he was. When he got out of prison, then we even he, he was like a big lad to us, you know. And I mean, and later on, you only realised he was only a couple of years older than you. But you know, we were we were we were fifteen, sixteen, seventeen year old um, young Republicans, and you know, he was such an inspiration to us. Uh, I, that's all I can I can describe it as, you know. And you know, he, he was he was just into everything. He, the energy of the man was unbelievable. I mean. He was into his music, he, you know, he was into Irish culture. And not a lot of people really know this, but we have a school now, a school in the Frishiga. Uh, it started off, uh, and we also have a, a, a family, an Irish family centre, all down in the Twinbrook Estate. And, you know, it's the lark, and you see the big the big picture of the lark, you know, and, and when, when you walk past that, Bobby started up the Irish classes, for, for the, the young children uh, before they went into the knee school way back in 1976 in a flat in Twinbrook. Irish classes were ongoing in a flat in Twinbrook and then the first Irish school started as well in a, in a, in a place in Twinbrook. So he was instrumental in all of that. And, you know, even now, I mean, right across the whole world, his name is, is you know, symbolised or, or, you know, the association with the Lark. Um, and that, you know, when, when you look at that school around there, and, and that was the type of a man, he was so energetic, so full of, of ideas, uh, a community activist before, uh, you know, people would have been community activists. He started up the first tenants association in Twinbrook. He started up the first, like we had a small hut where, where people would have came to meet and used to go there and play the guitar and sing stuff. Football, you know, he young people playing football, he young people like doing all that. So that was the type of person that he was. And, you know, as a gay, again, he went into jail quite quickly again. He went in in October of 1976. He was only out a short period of time, but he did so much and was so energetic when he was there. And then obviously, whenever, whenever you know, people went into jail then and the blanket protests and that there, and you would have had, you know, you would have had um, brought comms up and things like that. And, and then obviously when I went to jail then, I mean, I would have gotten comms from him and that. Um, as I say, it was just, it was for all the women, it was just so, it was so, it was just so sad. But it was also, you know, we were, we're, we're all so massively proud of them too, you know. And at that stage in the, in, on the hunger strike, obviously, you know, the three women that were on hunger strike in our mat, in, in the first hunger strike, Maria Farrell, who was later assassinated in Gibraltar, and Mary Doyle and, and Margaret Nugent. And obviously, because we were smaller numbers in the in the prison, and the decision was taken not to, to, to go on the second hunger strike. But you know, we were, we were always in constant contact with with the men in the blocks, and we were always in constant contact with people outside. Um, so we always had that comradeship, you know, and and you know the 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 flow of information and that. 
And, you know, while we were, as I said, when, when he became the, the MP, people were very, very hopeful, we very, you know, but, uh, you know, obviously a short period of time happened. And then when Bobby died and then, uh, you know, you had Frank Hughes and then you had Raymond and Patsy. And, you know, you, you're saying, and then the other, the other hunger strikers died. And it was just, it was just, um, it was a, a mixture of anger. The emotions was a mixture of anger and also a lot of pain as well. Uh, you were just answering all my questions there because I was going to ask how you did these feeding and the present then <clears throat> for their prisoners had started dying whenever they were on hunger strike. No, what was the feeling with yourselves whenever you were still in there and you were still not being classed as a political prisoner? It was very difficult at being in, in, in prison at, at those times because, I mean, you, you did, in one sense, you felt very, very, um, how would you put it, um, you know, useless almost, you know, you, you almost felt, um, you know, what can we do here? You know, what the, there was nothing more that people could do, but, you know, just that, that sense of, you know, frustration. Um, we always we, we we always had good communications with outside, and obviously there was things happening outside, and and you know, there were there were terrible things happening out there as well. But you know that we just what Cahill was saying about the the support, particularly um, you know the support right across um, the world, um, because I mean the this I mean we there were years with for the blanket protest and the, and the no wash protest in Armagh, and then the the all that for all that time you almost felt that the people had forgotten about you across the world. And then all of a sudden this, you know, when the hunger strike began, this huge sort of uh, support um, coming into being. So you, you had that, you had that sense of, you know, hopefulness. You had that sense of, um, you know, that, the, uh, the, you know, you were hopeful that, that this, this would turn into maybe something um, that, that would make the Brits, you know, uh, you know, sort of say, you know, well, well, you know, the, the, these demands are very basic demands. What, what, what these prisoners, yeah. are, you know, that type of thing didn't happen, obviously, um, at that time. But uh, as I say, you know, you were very, very conscious of the the support that was on the outside as well, and got a great comradeship from from everyone in the jails, but also from people on the outside as well. And I suppose how that ties on to the work that you were doing whenever you were in America and you were gaining that support from our diaspora that's all over there and lending their support to us. So you were still in America then when you learned about George and Pop. Um, how did you feel kind of at that time and then whenever you had to go back then to Derry? Well, what, what happened then... Uh... Cuba was, I, I, I was actually had left and gone to Miami and was in Fort Lauderdale uh, uh, when, when, uh, when we, we, Remy and Patsy O'Hara died. And so the, the next thing was, and, and again, I, I was, we're working around that because uh, unfortunately with every death, it was a huge kind of, demand for, for media and appearances and all that kind of thing uh, at the time. But I, I had eventually flown back then to New York because there was a huge Irish festival that was to take place in the Catskills just outside New York, a big annual get-together. Hundreds of thousands of Irish Americans attended that event. And, and so I'd returned to New York for that. And... Uh, and I actually was along with Martin Galvin at the time in, in Martin's apartment uh, when the news came on about the, the shooting in Derry. And it was just on in the background. And, you know, there was that many uh, dreadful things happening because, you know, n not only was you know, 1981 a dark year in terms of the, the, the cost that it was paid, uh, by by uh, very brave people during the struggle itself, but the cost that the people uh, paid on the streets, you know, with uh, during riots, with deaths from plastic bullets, you know, you name it, there was something else every day. It was just relentless, and it was uh, a dreadful, dreadful 
full time. And, uh, and so I saw the story just briefly on the news. I uh, heard about the shooting in Derry. Couldn't get any more information about it. And then the long and the short of it is we put a, a call through to the Norrie office in New York. And Martin Galvin was standing in front of me on the phone. And when he said, your name, George McBerty, uh, Pop McGuire, I, I just was gobsmacked, absolutely gobsmacked, because Pop was probably one of the last people I had been talking to before I left Derry. And, and to try and comprehend that George and Pop had been killed in, in this uh, shootout in Derry uh, was, was, was really, I just couldn't get my head around it. it took me hours to kind of try and communicate that information through, through my head in, in terms of the consequences of all that. So uh, that was that. As the day went on, uh, I actually managed to get a, a call through the Donna, who was uh, Pop's wife, and we had a conversation about what had happened. And uh, Donna explained to me essentially what had occurred in Southway and the whole story essentially as best she knew it at that particular point. And, uh, and all I could think about was uh, Donna and her grief and young Claire, who was only a baby at the time, Rosemary and her young family. Uh, they had uh, three young children at the time. The Maguire family, uh, the Mac, the McNutt family, the, the McBerties, all these families who had been in the struggle for thirty odd years and, and uh, had, had gone through every experience that there was in the last thirty years uh, leading up to that particular event, and so we we we, we felt their pain uh, initially for that period of time. Uh, Donna did say to me in a call, they're not getting buried until you come home. Simple as that. You know, I had a conversation with Mark Galvin. There was huge merit in me staying in America and continuing on with the campaign. But I, I just made the decision. I was going back. And, uh, and I flew out of New York that night. And I arrived back in Derry the night before the funeral. Uh, arrived at the wake house, uh, and uh, and and it was a dreadful time in Derry, and uh, people were uh, shot, and the consequences and the reverberations of George and Pop's death uh, were felt all over Craigan, all over Derry uh, at that particular time, and also the family of Eamon McCourt, who was seriously wounded. And it would be appropriate to remember Eamon Peggy McCourt in this, because unfortunately we lost uh, Eamon McCourt earlier this year to COVID. And so we thought about Magella and his family at that time. Uh, Eamon Peggy McCourt was the, the, the longest link with the whole event, uh, having been caught up in the that particular ambush on the, the 28th of May. And so I got back in time to the funerals, back in time to be, we actually spent most of the night preparing what we would do the next day in terms of the Guard of Honour and how the funeral would be arranged and organised. And uh, and so I was involved in all that uh, throughout the day. And uh, it was an absolutely dreadful time, dreadful in Derry, dreadful all over. Uh, George McBerty was a huge figure in, in, the, in terms of uh, uh, the IRA at the time, huge figure. And uh, Pop McGuire was, was, was very well known, uh, a bit younger than, than George, but uh, very skilled, very capable. And uh, so it was a huge shock uh, all over Derry at the time. Although I knew George since school days. Uh, I was closer to Pop. Pop was a, a particularly close friend of mine at that uh, at that stage. And so and then 
it reminds you just of there was so much going on. You just seem to come from one situation to another. And the, it was quite relentless throughout 1981 because you just moved from one uh, event to another. And, uh, most of them tragic, I'm afraid, uh, and had dire consequences. So uh, I got back and... Uh, and you know, the funny thing is, within a day or two, it was as if I was never away. But I felt like I was away forever uh, at that point. And then, you know, all our events happened and, and whatever. But it was a dreadful time for everybody involved. Definitely a dreadful time. The 1981 was a horrible, horrible year for a lot of people. And Jennifer, um, around the same time of the deaths of George and Pop, there was two children killed with plastic bullets as well in Belfast. Um, it was Julie Livingston and Caroline Kelly. And Julie had two brothers on the blanket protest. Can you tell us a wee bit about your memories of that kind of time um, in and around Belfast? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I remember people, as, as Cattle is saying, you know, um, but it was a dreadful time and, you know, every every day you were hearing about different things that were happening and, you know, tragic events, obviously, the the, the murder of those two young children. I mean, um, the, the young girl, Caroline Kelly, lives not too, or our family lives not too far where, where I'm sitting tonight. And I know there, there was uh, our anniversary just the other day there. Um, and, you know, I can remember, I remember, you know, particularly with the people that were out on protest, because especially whenever, whenever the, one of, you know, when Bobby and, and the hunger, the other fellas were dying, people would have come out and you know, rattled thin lids and that there and, and everything else to, to let people know. And then obviously the Brits and, and the RUC would have come into the areas. But I can remember distinctly one time, um, uh, I can't remember who it was, someone coming up on a, a, a visit and saying that, you know, when they were bringing their kids to protests or anything about the, the, the hunger strike and that, that they used to put on the wee cycling helmets, you know, the wee, the wee helmets the kids yeah. were cycling to protect their kids. I mean, that's, that's, that, that was something that, that they, they, they were doing every time they were bringing their children out to a protest. Because there were that many, there were that many young young children, and and, and people were getting shot dead by by these plastic and rubber bullets. And I think that that you know for and and you were hearing all this, and you were hearing about all the different things that were happening, um, and you know the people that were dying on the street, you know people were dying in the jails, and people were dying on the streets, and comrades, and you know, and it was it was just it was just um, it was just a, a, you know very very difficult time to be in prison as well. It was a very difficult time. And I know, um, you know, and I've spoken to people after this, you know, after I was I got out of out of jail and that, you know, and they're telling <laughs> friends of mine who were out here were saying they felt the exact same way. So so helpless almost and so you know frustrated. So um obviously as, as being in the in the prisons we felt that. But at the same time, people out here were, were, were going through um, a, a very bad, very difficult time as well. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it's come back and looking back on it now, 40 years later, I really remember sitting here discussing it 40 years later. And sometimes it doesn't seem it was that far away. And then there's other times it seems as if it was, you know, um, so far away. And and I think that, that the... The thing that that's always strikes me, you know, when we do sit and you know around commemorative times and that are, you know, it, it's it's when to look at how young, particularly how young, those hunger strikers were when they when they died, because you know, I mean, and for for their their the courage and the bravery of what they went through, just even in terms of the physical, you know, um, sort of. Um, around this thing journey that, that, that they went through in, ter or in terms of, of, of dying on hunger strike and you know they were so committed and they were so so just just committed to to you know the, the struggle um and you know that that again I didn't the only one I knew personally would have been Bobby you know in a personal sense but you know and and looking back on when he, when I said before when he was you know there with us for the short period that he was here with with young Republicans and Republicans in in this area, you know you could see that 
you could see that commitment with him. You know, you could see that that commitment. You know that that just you know that that his whole life. Um, you know, we we were at a we were at an event there a couple of weeks ago with myself, Shana Walsh, Jim Gibney, and Mary McGinn, and people all who who was sort of right talking about the hunger strike, and all knew Bobby personally in different sort of ways, and you know we were we were just sitting reflecting on it all, and you know, and it was like you know, young men and young women of that time, the war never came to us. Or sorry, that we never brought the war to people. The war came to us. We were young, young Republicans who, you know, you you you, you were facing on to the, the might of a of a of a, a a British state that you know were 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 capable of, of doing, you know, were capable of, of killing people, were capable of imprisoning people, and you know, really coming into our areas and 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 you know doing what they did, and they created they created that that young generation of people who were only, I mean, like we were just talking about the, the schoolboy attorney, Shimmy Fanuk and, and, and um, Alex Murphy. We were just taught 15 years of age, the were when they went to prison, the first time they went to prison, you know, and they were, we were, they were all so young and everybody was so young. And, you know, but at this, you know, at the same time, you know, they, they were the, the hunger strikers in particular. I always, um, you know, always their, their courage and their bravery just, just, uh, you know, I just sometimes can't fathom, you know, that that type of, you know, commitment that the, the, that they they had, they've had, they had, and their poor families too. I mean, their families, you know, to go up and watch that happening, and you know, and we were, again, you know, we were hearing about, you know, the way the families were being treated, and that it was just, it was just an horrendous time, I think, for everyone, and you know, especially for Cahill, who lost close comrades as well. You know, it, it, I think the the that. You know, for for everybody, and you said about those two young children, and you know, you see the wee, the wee mural up for Carl and Kelly, and the mural up for Julie Livingstone, and they're wee fresh faces. You know what I mean? It, it, and all those years robbed off from them and from their families as well. You know, it, it's just it was, it's just an awful thing to, to think about. It's horrible to even think about the the tragedies that have gone on, all because. Of Maggie Thatcher and her government and everything that the prisoners went through and especially allowing the 10 hunger strikers to die under her watch. Um, it's an absolute disgrace and there's not enough words to eliminate the disgust that we all feel for what happened around that time. Um, you're both of yourselves sacrificed so much as well. You both spent time in prison and you both did whatever you could for our struggle to try and bring us forward. And there's nothing that we could do to thank you and repay you for the time that you did give. But moving on from the struggle, you both then moved in to the political phase. So I know, Jennifer, you were a junior minister um, with Martin. Um, so I just would wonder um, if you would just briefly go over um, what influence did this period have on your life? And the decisions then that you know what made you decide that being a public representative was something that you could do and wanted to do and would advance the struggle. Yeah. Well, when I came out of prison, it was 1990, um, and I went in to work with the the Republican POW department, the Sinn Féin side POW department in the Bastable Street. Um, so, and what we did there was we would have sort of way visited. Um, prisoners and, the, and their families, you know, and made sure that, you know, people were getting looked after and that. Um, and I was always involved in community politics, you know, even before I went to, to, to prison. Um, um, and when I came out, I got very much involved in, in the local community, um, just to, to, to sort of, uh, I suppose, like most political activists at the end, you know, um, it, 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 grassroots activism is, you know, is, is activism on the ground. So, I mean, you were you were always into um, helping people and, and and trying to make their communities, our communities, a better place for people. And you know, I always seen, I mean, uh, Republicans as agents of change. So we always wanted to to better people's lives. And you know, the struggle the struggle um, with three different phases. Um, and obviously, then in 1994, and you had the the ceasefires in, in 1984, 96. And I think that, that then 
going forward. Um, obviously, Sinn Féin had, you know, from from the, the Bobby being elected and um, the the, uh, the the electoral sort of journey there, I think that that Sinn Féin had become quite, you know, uh, uh, dominant in, in in local areas as well. And then um, I went in to be uh, went in as a co-option to Lisburn Council in two thousand and six. And then I um, went on to be an MLA for, uh, I think it was three terms till 2016. Um, and I think that, that really, to me, that was just that was just the next stage in, in the struggle, you know, because, you know, it, I mean, our struggle, our struggle has always been about, you know, the reunification of our, our country, about equality. Um, but it's been, it's been a social, it's a, it's a struggle about, the making the social lives of people better, the economic lives of people better. So it's about tackling poverty and doing all those things. So and it's about making uh, communities better for people and, and and giving people the opportunity of a better a better sort of life and and, and better conditions and housing, all those issues. So it was a, it was just a, a natural progression for me, or to do that. Um, and I think that that really, in terms of where we were then, way back in, you know, when I'm going back maybe to 1975, 76, I'm thinking of Bobby being, you know, our sort of, our leader in this area, in this, in this community. And then, you know, going straight up to the present day, you know, and, and it, it's, it's obviously, I mean, and, you know, I mean, we have brought the struggle so far ahead I mean, we're now on the on the threshold of uh, uniting Ireland. We're now on the threshold of having that, you know, that that sort of goal that those ten men died for, and all the other people, you know, in, in, that died for. And I think that, that that's something for me, you know, like even now, you know, uh, and I mean, I am still I'm still a Sinn Féin activist, even though I'm not an electorate representative. But you know that that that. To me, the, the see the growth even in our party, you know, and to see that, and to particularly see the young people. It's great to see so many young people becoming involved and, and doing all that. So and I, I just and I have I go back to say it again when I when I see the the Irish language, um, you know, the the sorry, the it's called the Frishiga around there and the lark, the big lark on the side of it, and you see the Irish um the the, the Family center as well. It's just to me like that. That is just you know so so close, so close to my heart because you know the lark was was always sort of quality sort of um association with him and he did his, his writing and his poems and you know things like that. So you know for me it was just but in a personal sense that journey was just a, nat a natural progression. And Cal, was it the same for yourself? You were obviously the first Sinn Fein. Mayor in Derry, and I know you're still very much active on the ground um, in the community. Um, so it was the same for yourself. It was just after the struggle, the early part of the struggle in the 80s, and then you moved on then to an elected rep after that. Yeah, just a wee quick point, Kiva, on the connections between things. Uh, well, when I arrived at the wake house where Pop McGuire was being waked, just as I got back. Uh, on the wall, immediately above his remains, was the uniform that he had worn at Francie Hughes' uh, funeral just a few short weeks beforehand. Something that he talked about continuously, about the sense of pride he had to be able to be at the guard, taking part in the guard of honour uh, for Francie Hughes. And so... A wee point is the courage and the bravery uh, of those men uh, is awe-inspiring. That was very definitely the uh, lasting image I have of my involvement with the diaspora in the United States. They love the hunger strikers. They have absolute utmost respect for their courage and dedication uh, to the struggle. Uh, following that, uh, we were quite active then in the days. The hunger strike uh, continued on through 1981, and uh, more men died as the weeks and months progressed. And 
And so we were all involved in some way or another, doing what we could. But uh, the point about the hunger strikers, if they could do what they could do, uh, faced with, with the, the difficulties that they had to work through and the sacrifices they were willing to make, then people like us could do what we could going forward. And, and, and that was a huge motivating thing uh, for everybody concerned. Uh, in terms of the politics, I had always taken a very keen interest in the political aspect of what we were doing. It was absolutely central uh, to the struggle. Uh, we had not been involved. I suppose Bobby's election was a key turning point as well, a key uh, event that, 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 that began a conversation, I think, within uh, Republicanism and within uh, Sinn Féin. And so very quickly thereafter, I played a role in Sinn Féin as well. And, uh, and then it's funny the way things happen, you know, but, you know, within a year, I was a candidate in the assembly election along with Martin McGuinness. I was Martin's running mate, and we were after an assembly seat all. And it was our first venture in the electoral politics in real terms. And so didn't really know how all that would work out. But before it was even announced, I ended up back in Tullin Road Jail. The following August, uh, we were affected then by the whole issue of paid and farmers because no matter what else was going on, the British were doing their dirty work and the spooks were keeping at it in terms of what they had to do. And so 40 or 50 of us were arrested in Derry the following August, uh, uh, including your father, by the way, uh, who just coincidentally, Kiva, uh, happened to be caught up in all that. But uh, in any event, so I, I become a candidate for Sinn Féin whilst being uh, a prisoner in Crumlin Road Jail, which was uh, comical, really, when, when, when you consider what was going on. But there's some really, really funny stories related to that, but uh, I'll not recount them all now or go over them. But uh, in any event, that was that. Uh, we did actually mark one seat in Boyle on that occasion, and it began a sort of journey in terms of uh, Sinn Féin's development at that time. But it was years and years and years uh, of show, political show trials, appeals, and whatever. And, you know, none of us really got out again until late 1986. Uh, I eventually got elected to something in 1993. After all of that, uh, we won the city side by election. And, and so I ended up in the council uh, after all that time. And... I was there for three terms, but uh, in 2000, we had never had a mayor, a Republican mayor of Derry, or a Sinn Féin mayor in particular. And so it was a great honour and privilege for the party to ask me to do it. Uh, and it was our time. And uh, it was a great buzz about Derry at the time because we had broken open that stranglehold that had been created by the SDLP, essentially in the aftermath of the old unionist domination from the corporation days. And so it was very, very important. And, uh, and so that happened. And it was a great occasion for Derry Republicans. Uh, I was privileged, uh, albeit humbled as well, to be asked to take on that role. And, uh, and so a... It was a great occasion when talking about prisoners and linkages and whatever. Of course, during the term of office, I made sure that we always had room in the mayor's parlour for any Republican prisoners that were out there or any people who'd been away in prison. In fact, one of the things I remember well is welcoming the, the Balcom Street team into the mayor's parlour uh, one night, so we had a good night for three or four hours in that. But and in all those things, uh, the hunger strikers were an inspiration. They shaped and formed as the political strategy uh, for the movement going forward. And also 
shaped and formed the things that people like me would do in the years that followed it. And, uh, and so politics is a very, very important part of the struggle. And as Jennifer said, we're at a point where this is deliverable. We've arrived at a stage where this can be done and people just need to believe in it. And we need to widen out the conversation because a quick point I remembered about it, see during the days of the hunger strikes, we formed a huge alliance everywhere we could find it. We found friends all over the country, all across our neighborhoods and communities, all across the world where we could reach them. And those big alliances and those types of uh, political uh, development are the type of things that will deliver ultimately the, uh, the result for the referendums, which will inevitably happen. And so uh, that's the work now. Uh, and so we keep on going with it. And I continue to fulfill whatever role I can in the political scheme of things in Derry. And, and so we just keep at it. And I can't disagree with you. We are now on the cusp of getting our referendum and not only getting the referendum, but ensuring that everyone votes for the United Ireland that you and us have all fought for. And I'm not going to keep you any longer. I think I've taken up enough of your time, even though I could sit and listen to you both. Um, your stories are amazing. And your stories are just as awe-inspiring as the 10 men that unfortunately lost their lives 40 years ago. Um, these are both fantastic. And I just want to thank you, not just for your time this evening, but thank you for everything you've done through the struggle from your time in jail to your activism, to your elected reps positions. And I can only hope that we all gather together now, reach out to our connections, reach out to those people who are behind us, reach out to those Americans who haven't forgotten about us and get them all behind us um, and ensuring that we are definitely on the cusp of delivering a United Ireland and it is something that we are definitely going to be seeing in the next few years, definitely, or let's hope it's in the next few years anyway. But again, I can't thank you enough both for your time and for everything that you've done for our struggle and our political struggle over the last number of years.